we here at the foundation every year try to recognize individuals who have made a profound contribution to the Chinese-American relationship. Uh, we honor those individuals for their uh, accomplishments, but we also honor them for their work in furthering understanding between the Chinese people and the people of the United States, and furthering the understanding between our two governments. And one of the individuals who's done a magnificent job of that is Dr. David Lambton. Dr. Lambton um, has been instrumental in explaining to the American people and to other academics the importance of the relationship between our two countries, China and the United States. And he's uh, one of the foremost scholars in research between uh, on uh, China. Uh, Dr. Lampton um, received his BA degree and master's degree and PhD from Stanford. He's presently the Hyman Professor and Director of China Studies at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He also heads the SICE uh, uh, China, uh, China School that uh, oversees all of uh, the School of, uh, of International Studies presence in China. He's the author of many books, many scholarly studies of China. The latest uh, is entitled Leaders Ruling China from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping published in, 19, in 2014. Uh, Dr. Lampton, that's quite, a, quite a, an accomplishment to cover from Deng Xiaoping to, uh, to um, President Xi. So it's my pleasure now to present to Dr. Lampton on behalf of the foundation uh, our award for Lifetime Achievement Award in U.S.-China Education, presented to Dr. David M. Lampton by the U.S.-China Policy Foundation, November 17, 2016. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador Sasser. I'll, I'll say Jim. And uh, good evening, everybody. I hope people in the rear uh, can hear. Um, in any case, uh, thank you to the U.S.-China Policy Foundation for inviting my wife, Susan, and me here this evening. We're both thrilled uh, to be among so many friends and to uh, also gratified by the acknowledgement of the foundation. Um, I'm particularly pleased to share this evening uh, with my fellow honorees, uh, friends of long standing, uh, Secretary Barbara Franklin and Ambassador Tsui Chen Kai, as well as United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki moon. Secretary Franklin, when I was really starting my career on the East Coast in New York, was a mentor of mine in uh, in New York City, and I've always been appreciative of the help she gave me and was such a constructive board member on the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Uh, Ambassador Tsui is a, a graduate of SICE and um, uh, was a student with uh, my predecessor and uh, a great scholar, A. a Doak Barnett, so it's particularly great to be here this evening with the ambassador. Um, who's such a good friend of U.S.-China relations and uh, certainly uh, the Foundation. I want to start by saying a few uh, deeply felt words about our hosts 
Ernestine and Wang Ji, uh, because they've made enormous uh, contributions to the public understanding of China. And uh, their work goes well before the foundation's founding in 1995. Uh, they, their labors go back, uh, and particularly Dr. Wang Ji, to the uh, foundation of the China Collection for the Library of Congress. It has over a million volumes and is the biggest holding uh, of any collection outside of China. Uh, and so when I was a graduate student, of course, the Library of Congress was one of the most remarkable collections for research. And we, I think all scholars of, of China really owe Dr. Wang Ji an enormous debt of gratitude. And this foundation is just the latest expression of his commitment to that relationship. Turning to U.S.-China relations just for a minute, it's obvious to all of us here that America's just uh, concluded a very grueling election. And the voters have spoken, but not much productive, realistic, or enlightening was said about China policy during that marathon campaign, except to raise red flags about tariffs, alliance management, and military spending. Our national debate did not focus on the central questions our new executive and le legislative branch officials must now address. In Beijing as well, an important airing of views about China's domestic and foreign policy choices also is underway. Long ago, Britain's Harold Macmillan reportedly was asked what blew even the steadiest ship off course as history unfolded. And his perhaps apocryphal response was, events, my dear boy, events. Our just completed general election is just one such event. And we can be sure there are going to be others. The tectonic plates of post-World War II uh, order are shifting because of tumultuous domestic political developments in China, the United States, and around the world. The post-World War II free trade order is under pressure. World trade and trade in commercial services shrank 14% in 2015. Treaty arrangements in East Asia are fraying. Regional proliferation dangers are mounting. Central Asia and the Middle East are seemingly in endless turmoil, and the European project is searching for a way forward. Amidst these swirling events, we must return to strategic first principles. We must keep two different ideas in our minds simultaneously. The first is that strategic foundations are essential for the management of U.S.-China relations. But we also must keep in mind that our two countries have now a relationship between two societies, not just two governments and not certainly just two leaders. Our two societies' uh, interdependence provides dynamism and durability and creative potential that are our relation's greatest strengths. These linkages among our local governments, companies, and civic organizations remind us about how much there is in U.S.-China relations to celebrate. One opportunity to come out of the recent elections, for instance, is that about 34 state governorships are in the hands of Republicans now who are generally free trade and investment oriented and likely to be dedicated to stable, productive, economic, and cultural ties with China. I'd, what are the strategic questions on which we both should focus at this moment of transition in both of our countries? In the United States, I would ask, the U.S. policy in the Obama administration asserts that we don't have to choose among our challenges to security and in other realms. There's North Korea, ISIS, terrorism, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Russia, and China. They're all currently mentioned as central challenges 
although somewhat over different time frames and in various ways. I would ask instead, do we have the luxury of not choosing among our threats, of having no priorities? And if we must choose, is China reasonably placed on the list of threats with others? The first obligation of leadership is to bring commitments into alignment with resources. Not doing so fosters anxiety among our allies, our friends, emboldens competitors, creates domestic confusion, and gradually bleeds our national strength and resolve. There are only a limited number of ways to achieve alignment between our resources and our commitments. Reduce the threats, reduce commitments, multiply friends, or expand our financial and political resources. We have to do all four. In my view, China's best viewed as a competitor with whom we can deal, not an existential threat now or any time soon. Second, an enduring national interest of the United States has been to seek a sovereign, cohesive China and to prevent a circumstance in which Eurasia, the Eurasian continent is under the dominance of any single hostile power or powers. This has been the lodestar of U.S. policy, whether past challenges came from Europe in the 19th century, Japan in the first half of the 20th, Soviet Union thereafter, or our more current problems uh, involving China and Russia. If this remains a defining national interest, that we want no single power uh, dominating the Eurasian landmass, then how does driving Moscow and Beijing together by putting pressure on Europe from one end and on, uh, China from the Pacific end on the other serve that objective? I also want to ask Beijing a question, and that is that while China has achieved dramatic increases in its national strength over the last 40 years, and the international system has made and should continue to make room for China in global ins institutions, would it not be preferable for China to stick with the core features of Deng Xiaoping's strategy, namely, reassure your neighbors and reassure the world beyond so that China can focus on its pressing internal problems and focus its popular energies on the protracted task of China's national renewal. Demograph demographic trends in China as, and the gargantuan task of rebalancing the economy all require all the attention China's leaders can devote. Of all the shared interests between China and America, the greatest is our common need for national development and renewal. The quickest way to a better relationship with Washington is for Beijing to improve ties with its neighbors. Recent moves towards peaceful management of maritime issues with the Philippines and Malaysia, in my view, should be, and I believe are, welcomed in the United States. These are two right steps in the right direction. By way of conclusion, I want to ask both sides two additional questions. First is, how can we cooperate to increase the density of economic and security institutions in Asia in which we both are participants? And second, are not the transnational problems the world faces almost because the transnational problems the world faces becoming existential security challenges in and of themselves. Whether we consider climate change, global health, or the need to jointly contribute to the management of the world economy. Elevating our shared strategic gaze to the global level will be difficult, but it is essential. So once again, I want to thank the Foundation for the honor and thank all of you for attending and supporting the important work of the Foundation. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to my views. <laughs>